Good morning and thanks for having me today. Since I started playing for the pianos and dealing with romantic performance practice, I also developed a big interest in historical recordings. In the beginning, like many early musicians who work with 19th century music, I mostly listened to these recordings just by distant listening, so not focusing so much in the details, but just getting a general impression of these recordings. And I still concentrated in that moment most of my work on written sources. And then, little by little, and fascinated by all of the beauties that um, these pianists brought out in their interpretations, in a very natural way, I started to annotate my scores with what I was hearing, as well as playing along with these recordings. Nevertheless, I felt that my playing was still stylistically somehow distant from what I was listening. And I started uh, researching and dedicating more and more time of my preparation for projects, working with historical recordings as part of my practicing time. Lately, I have focused mostly in the study of the recordings of the pupils of Clara Schumann. Um, with this presentation, I would like to share with you some of the experimentation I've done during the last years. I believe that when dealing with recordings, it is important to first understand the context and aesthetics behind these performances and only then analyze the recordings and even later try to imitate their style. I don't think it's desirable to embody this way of playing without understanding, for example, the piano technique of these musicians, imagining how they played even from a physical perspective. So what do we know about this topic in relation to Clara? Well, we know that she played with no harshness, whatsoever, um, with hands always close to the keyboard. Notes were obtained by press pressure and not struck from above, also in forte passages. And she used very much the wrist action um, instead of the elbow. Since this conference is about re early recordings, I'm afraid my possibilities of talking about written sources are of course um, restrained. But uh, for those who are not at all acquainted with testimonies of Clara's students, um, I made a very brief summary of some features that uh, seem to be particularly important to her. To achieve a singing tone in playing, um, kind of passaging, so not to hurry over beautiful passages, um, good rhythm, um, a correct accentuation, good pedaling, arpeggi and legato. The Kindred Senem is a very fascinating case study because of the numerous recordings of Clara students that have come to us. Also, as it's a, it's a collection of different character pieces, this gives the possibility of analyzing different approaches to different pianistic textures and characters. So, about the first number. We know that um, finger legato, holding the notes longer than what is actually written, was something very difficult to notate in music score. Um, 19th century composers just suspected that pianists would do it without having to write this in much detail. The biggest, advantages, the biggest advantage of analyzing walls is that the lengthening of the pedal is not confused with the lengthening of the notes, since the pedal was recorded as another parameter. This is a big advantage compared to analyzing acoustic recordings, in which you can't really tell in most of the cases what was held by the finger and what was held by the foot. For the re this reason, I worked mostly with Fanny Davis Rowe when working with this piece. Of course, one should be careful, because some companies did a lot of post-editing on the roll and this information is not any more reliable, like for example Ampico. Uh, but it's not the case for uh, Veltemillon, for which Fanny Davis recorded the Kindertzene. In this score, I annotated the finger legato with a green color um, after Fanny Davis wrote, and also the pedaling. You can see that Clara only marks the pedaling when it is strictly necessary because it's not possible to hold the second harmony for many pianists, but Fanny pedals with every harmony. You can see how the role looks in the um, Cubase program. 
I added some names of notes so that you can um, follow better. And how she prolongs certain notes um, of the accompaniment. And um, also of the melody in order to achieve a good legato. And that she sustains very long the, the, the middle voice in the right hand. As I said, we know that achieving a beautiful legato was very important for Clara. How to achieve this continuity of the line, which was so relevant for her, from a pianistic perspective? In the instructive edition, Clara gave many finger substitutions as a tool for achieving it. In some cases, it was even extreme, as in the last number of the Davidsbündler, in the beginning. For octaves, Clara also gives usually three, four, five fingerings. Um, in legato passages. And back to the rolls. Um, rolls can tell us what can be deduced from length, which is not much, but at least a bit, namely substitution, where it is not possible to hold notes without using it, hand distribution, where it's not uh, possible to place certain chords or passages together unless you use a particular distribution of voices. Some fingerings in scales can be deduced because of the groupings, and other fingers um, can be deduced from length, like thirds, six, sixths, octaves, chords. at least imagine if Fanny played with legato fingerings for octaves. Well, there's not enough overlapping in this case to be 100% sure. But I think that from this passage of Glukis Genuk, we can be quite certain that she did, at least for some. When doing octaves with 555, so a non-legato fingering, one usually lifts both fingers more or less at the same time. But when doing it with 4-5 or 3-4-5, one tends to lift the thumb a bit before in relation to the fingers, which can do the real legato. Here we can see that, at least for some of them, she played with this kind of gesture. So this is the left hand, so the 4-5 finger would be in the, in the low voice, or the 3-4-5. And you can see that the thumb is indeed um, much shorter. And yes, uh, we can be sure, for example, here, um, a bit late, just a tiny bit later, that um, she used indeed the finger substitution marked by Clara in, um, in this uh, very similar passage. So, in some cases, Clara did not annotate in the edition any pedal markings. What to do with a um, very rhythmical passage? Uh, with a very rhythmical piece, such as the Wichtige Begebenheit from the Kinderzähne. We can listen um, what Fanny did, reproduced on a Welte um, piano owned by Dennis Hall. <laughs> First, I found this a bit confusing um, because in some moments it sounds very uh, blurry. Clara and her father were very much concerned about achieving a transparent sonority, unlike what Vic called sardonically the performers of the future, so Liszt and other moderns. And we even know that, that uh, because of, of, of her pupil Müller Reuter, that she changed uh, some pedalings of Chopin in order to achieve this more transparent sonority. Um, so, yeah, I annotated the pedaling that used Fanny into my score and tried to, piece the, um, to play the piece with this pedaling in order to understand a bit better what was going on.
Of course, um, one of the problems uh, with rolls is that they cannot record half pedals. So many subtleties get lost. And um, by listening to the electrical recording um, of funny, of course, uh, more subtle um, in dynamics and therefore in phrasing, um, one can see that uh, one, can, one can see some sense behind um, these, in first sight, bizarre pedalings. In some cases, they express some of the phrasing or of the rhythmic structure. In some other cases, um, pressing a new pedal can give some sense of accent, or even not using not using the pedal um, can give some kind of direction. <laughs> So let's go now to the concerto. What I believe is most fascinating about Fanny Davis' recording of it, it's her extremely refined and varied way of arpeggiating, which was of an enormous help and inspiration for me. Let's listen to the uh, first solo played by Fanny. <laughs> After the close listening to this recording, also in slow motion and trying at the piano um, and comparing them with Fanny, I developed also some kind of systematization of the annotation of different uh, types of arpeggi. So um, I will just try to explain briefly, and um, there are things that are very normal, like the plaque or the arpeggio, that just that means to play together or not together. <laughs> and, but we also have, for example, the downwards arpeggio. And that is actually not from the concerto, but from the instructive edition, from the one, one of the pieces of the uh, movements of the Nachstücke. And then we, I noted different kinds of arpeggio. For example, the arpeggio vif, a uh, fast um, arpeggio. The arpeggio do, is slow and soft. The, and then, because she uses um, many types of arpeggio in order to bring out accents, or as for Sandy, um, I marked these two types. And then other very interesting um, effects that, um, that she does um, is that um, she plays first the bass and then the rest, like for example in the, con in the recording of the concerto where she plays um, here this chord, the first the F and then the A and the D sharp together. When everyone of course could play this completely together. And we can also find this kind of uh, yeah separating the bass of the of the rest in in the active edition here in the langsam. And another possibility can be um, to um, play first the bass, but then do an arpeggio, or to do an first an arpeggio and then a plaque, which is a very interesting effect I find. Um, and then to do, for example, um, just yeah, a broken chord, so plug in, plug in. And now let's go to the Dabby Spindler. We have two recordings of Pupils of Clara. We have the Fanny Davis recording of 1930, where she does not record number um, 3, 7, um, 15 and 16. And we have the recording of Adelina de Lara of 1950. Um, they were both quite old when they recorded them, especially at um, De Lara. And we know that um, Fanny did not record at all um, these numbers that are missing. It's not that um, because of the takes that she did and that, that, that we have uh, access to. Um, we know that it was not that she recorded them and she was not happy and asked them, them not to be published. She really did not. Uh, play them or record them. So I got the metronomes of the recordings of Fanny and, um, and Adelina and compared them with the original edition and with the destructive edition. 
It's important to say that the Davids Bündler have two versions. In the first version of the original edition, there are not metronomes, only in the second one. And Clara gave the same metronomes for both versions. Adelina recorded the first version and Fanny did a mixture. So, for um, these are my conclusions <laughs> uh, after comparing uh, these metronomes. For fast and energetic movements, we can say that Adelina Lara plays faster than Fanny, except in some in which she plays the same. Um, but in number nine, she um, plays much slower than Fanny, but also than the uh, original edition and that the instructive edition. Um, in slow movements, um, Fanny plays slower or similar to Adelina, with exception of number 11, which anyway the difference is not so significant. And yeah, comparing um, now Fanny to, um, to the editions, and then we can see that Fanny has a tendency to follow Clara me Clara's metronomes, even if, if in, in some movements she takes a bit different tempi. In fast tempi, she's quite similar to Clara, but with some small exceptions. And in, sl and in slow movements, she's really very similar to Clara. And she's really amazingly close in many of them. Um, and with Adelina, um, depending on the movement, she seems closer to Clara. And in others, she seems closer to the original edition. And then in, the, in, in others, she just seems to do something in between. Fanny Davis um, was regarded as the student of Clara who played in a more similar way to her and therefore I decided to work mostly with her recording. I listened to her, drew general conclusions about her playing, then recorded the numbers that she did not left to posterity. I tried to imitate with my playing some of what I heard that she did in her recording. And I was also inspired by other recordings of hers, by the fingerings and indications of the instructive edition. In addition to this, I tried to adopt the technical characteristics of Clara that I mentioned in the beginning, such as the low wrist, the knuckles in, if possible, hand contact with the keys, sitting low and a bit more towards the keyboard, um, wrist action for chords, more pressure than striking the keys from above for uh, loud passages. And even if I did not um, succeed with everything that I planned to implement into my playing, I certainly learned a lot. So I hope that you enjoy it and thanks for having me today.